Hey there, welcome to Main Street Living. I am Cheryl Nelson. Hey, I'm Quincy Carr. And I'm Danielle Alvari. So Danielle, Quincy, I'm getting kind of excited because things are slowly opening up across the states and maybe we can start to get rid of some of those masks. Uh, yes. Hopefully, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm ready to recycle mine or ma perhaps make a mosaic. I don't know. Everything's still <laughs> yeah, up in the air. That's a great idea. I'll probably be donating some of them, keeping my favorite ones. But, you know, speaking of that, with the pandemic, we've got a lot to talk about today, a full show. And one of the things we're going to talk about is just how important pulmonary therapy is for COVID long haulers. That's right. That's right. And we're remembering two significant milestones in American history today, too. We're also going to get to see a new sports show, a preview of that that's going to be available on your view. And first, we have found signs of intelligent life on late night TV, if you can believe it. That and more is coming up next right here on Main Street Living. Hey guys, welcome back to Main Street Living. Uh, Danielle, Cheryl, with all that we've gone through the past year, of course, I think many of us are in search of some entertainment that's a little lighter, maybe funny or out of the ordinary. What do you yes, think? maybe even something with aliens or puppets. I think this is going to make your day. So here to tell us more about their new series, Earth to Ned. Please welcome Brian Henson and Cornelius to the show. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love you guys. Bye. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so cute. Brian, we absolutely love Earth to Ned. Tell us all about the show. Well, the the, the idea is that Ned, Ned, who's like eight times bigger than Cornelius, yeah. he, came to, he came to Earth with Corn Cornelius as his lieutenant on their ship. Right. Right. And uh, they came to kind of invade Earth for mm. Ned's father, who's the the admiral of the fleet, very mm -hmm. destructive alien culture. But what happened is when they arrived, Ned started watching television and he just fell in love with people and everything about celebrities and television. And so he wanted to do his own TV show. So he wanted it to be a, like a late night talk show. So he forced Cornelius to be his co-host, yeah. which initially Cornelius was not at all happy about. No. But he grew to enjoy it. Yeah. Well, and, I, got, I got this then, code out of the deal, so, you know, it's pretty good. <laughs> so then they, nice they interviewed, so they beamed celebrities in unexpectedly. Uh -huh. A celebrity might be doing whatever they were doing, and they get beamed onto Ned's ship, where they then do a, an interview with, with Cornelius and Ned. It's a, what we set out to do was make something that was really fun and funny but also smart. So I call it like intelligent nonsense. Ooh, so Ned doesn't know any, Ned doesn't know anything about the world. He doesn't really, he only knows what he knows through television. So he kind of has it all wrong when he's doing these interviews, but he loves everything about, about earth. So it's a very sort of uplifting, hmm. fun, funny series. It's, 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 it has a very, it's very positive. And, and, and yet, all of the conversations are on a very much on an um, adult level, mm -hmm. although Ned is a moron, so so he gets <laughs> things wrong all the time, which is hilarious. I'm glad but, you can get away with saying that. <laughs> but it, so it, yeah. so it kind of works for audiences of all ages. It's definitely safe for kids. Kids mm -hmm. love it. Mm -hmm. But as a talk show, it's basically like it's like an adult late night talk show, although it's safe for kids. Yeah. Well, I feel for Ned because I also watch way too much television, but I do know Cornelius. You guys had one of the best talk show sidekicks in the business visit, Andy Richter. Oh. Did you learn oh. anything valuable from him? Oh, he gave me the best advice. He told me that if an interview isn't going well between the host and the guest, just stay out of it. <laughs> Let the A-listers dig their own hole. You'll come out smelling like a peachy rose. <laughs> so Cornelius, I'm curious. Your your body is very interesting. It looks like kind of um, a nose that maybe was a pig, and then your eyes. Oh. I'm not sure what animal, but um, I'm getting more ant eater, Cheryl. Ant eater. I see that yeah. too. Talk about your appearance a little bit and move your yeah. eyes. I love. I want to see your eyes move around. Well, yeah, let's see your eyes move. Okay. All right. Fine. First of all, 
I just want to say, I don't think this is the place where you should be flirting with me so hard. Well, you know, you are kind of cute. Well, all right. Well, he's an alien. He's based on no Earth creatures, particularly. He's, yeah. he's just from a, a weird planet. What planet were you from again? Cornassian. Cornassian. I'm a Cornassian. Cornelius from Cornassian. There you go. Yeah. We're not very creative with the names here. It's like calling somebody Earthy. Hey, nice to meet you, Earthy. <laughs> Should I go by Earthy? Sure, why not? Okay. <laughs> so, Brian, tell us, where did the inspiration for the show come from? Um... Actually, it was after we did the show for sci-fi called Creature Shop Challenge, mm -hmm. where we were doing animatronic creatures of all sorts. And in every episode, we were doing different ones. And and um, our producing partners on that, um, they we got together and we started talking about what could we do with cool, fun animatronic characters. And we got this idea to to do these aliens, and Ned particularly is huge. He he really is yeah, eight yeah, times bigger than Cornelius, there. and it was just boy. it was just a fun opportunity to do these really weird characters and justify it by them them being aliens. And um, oh, where what was the question I was answering? Um, just how why, how the I idea answer? for the show came? Yeah. Oh, how the idea? So yeah. So then we were thinking. We've been trained. We've been doing an improv show for for years now called Puppet Up Uncensored, and underneath of Cornelius is a is a guy named Michael Ustrom. What? Cornelius doesn't know him, what? but he is actually underneath. And Michael and and Paul Rugg, who's who's performing um, Ned, there we've been doing um, improv comedy over the last like twelve mm -hmm. to fifteen years, mm -hmm. and we have a live show called Puppet Up Uncensored, and it was like. This was a really cool opportunity to bring the improv improv improvising skills of our puppeteers together with sophisticated animatronic puppets, which is never, yeah. we've never done that before. Because normally with animatronics, you lock the dialogue, you rehearse for weeks and weeks because they're so complicated. And so it just turned out to be just this really fun thing. And tough because they improvise the, the the interviews are not scripted they they are improvised mm -hmm. they they're real interviews and ned ned is performed by six puppeteers and to improvise with six puppeteers all working on one character is really kind of delightful and i at and i was terrified it wasn't going to work and then yeah. and then it worked great i yeah. think well, ned, ned sounds kind of high maintenance yeah, yeah. Six yeah. People like, him. I've also getting six Ned... performers to work together is like herding egotistical cats. <laughs> I've heard that Cornelius, Ned is Cornelius, very demanding. Cornelius takes three three puppeteers to no, work Cornelius. This meta conversation is kind of you freaking me out, Brian. I have no idea what, what you're talking, talking, talking about. about. I got to tell you, this Michael guy keeps following me around. I need to talk to you about him a little bit. <laughs> Cornelius, I'm curious. Before yes. we go, I hear Ned is kind of demanding to work for. So mm. what are the challenges of working with Ned? Well, I have two answers for you. One answer is if Ned is going to see this interview, and what answer is if he's not going to see this interview. Working with Ned is so challenging to keep up with his keen intellect. That's and, the one for him watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And working with Ned is difficult because I have to keep all of his excretions in check or people are going to slip all over our stage floor. That's true. <laughs> yeah. You know it's true. You guys are a blast. Thank you so, so much. And people can go where to learn more and watch. Oh, uh, where to go? We'll go to Disney Plus. Yeah. Uh, Disney Plus, we're streaming on Disney Plus. Um, the show is great. great. Please, Please do. do. Uh, or you can go to Henson.com and learn a little bit more about the show, but mostly go to Disney Plus and see it because it's it's really fun. Earth to Ned. I'm excited. Yeah. Guys, thank you so much. Cornelius, you're going to oh. get a big hug. Oh, right on. I'm warming up my arms for the hug. Oh, look at that. Oh. <laughs> All right, that was way too much fun, but we have more fun coming up, but stick with us. Next segment, we're gonna explore some history. You don't wanna miss it. Welcome back into Main Street Living. Now, Quincy Cheryl, we love to have a lot of fun on this show, but we also like to take time to talk about issues that are really important. And over this last year, really, a lot of us across the country have experienced this rallying cry against racism and inequity. 
Yeah, yeah, and unfortunately, this is a fight that has been going on for a very long time. And this year marks the 100-year anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre, where a prosperous Black neighborhood was burned to the ground by white mobs and dozens of people were killed. Now, the date is being commemorated with public events and efforts to raise awareness. Tiffany Bruton with Cox in Tulsa is here with more about the community's efforts. Thank you so much for joining us today on Main Street Living. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. It's good to see you both. You as Likewise. well. And I'm sad to say this, but a lot of people are not aware of what happened. So give us a quick reminder of the events that occurred in the Tulsa Race Massacre back in 1921. Cheryl, you're not alone. It's, it's, it's gone as a secret for a very long time. So in 1921, one of the worst acts of racial violence happened right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It was ignited when a mob of white men started to enter into the streets of what was then Black Wall Street. It's often also called Greenwood. They were doing so in response to a newspaper article they'd seen earlier that day in the Tulsa Tribune. And the headline read, uh, Nab the Negro Man. Mm. Uh, so mm. what had happened that caused that article to publish the day before a young black shoeshine boy by the name of Dick Rollins, well-known name now, he entered into the elevator of the Drexel building in downtown Tulsa. He commonly did this. He was a shoeshine boy. He would go in to use the restroom. Sarah Page was a young elevator operator who was working in the elevator that day. As Mr. Rowland entered the elevator, the doors began to close. Sarah Page screams. The door reopens. Dick Rowland flees the building. He was, ar he was arrested later that day uh, and taken to the jail. The article then publishes the next morning telling the story of what happens. Angry white mob begins to push into the streets of Black Wall Street. They arrived with weapons. Uh, many deputized, uh, they arrived, as the story's been told, there were airplanes with kerosene bombs. Mm -hmm. There was fire. They, they came ready to fight. 18 hours later, the community laid in ruins. Mm -hmm. Very successful businesses were in ashes. Uh, families' homes were destroyed. Thousands left homeless. Uh, the, the community was devastated. Most, wow. though, devastating was the fact that there were hundreds of lives lost mm. in this event. It's a tragic, wow. tragic moment in our history. But what I can tell you, uh, the reason I can smile is the spirit of Black Wall Street did not die that day. It lives on in Tulsa today. Wow. Well, uh, Tiffany, you know, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for resharing that history, because, you know, as Cheryl said, a lot of people aren't f familiar with what actually happened. But what is currently being done to commemorate this 100 year anniversary of this tragedy? So to your point, for decades, we didn't talk about the Tulsa race massacre. I've lived in Tulsa my entire life and I was in my mid 30s before I ever heard the story of what happened in 1921. But in the last 20 years, the community's done a truly amazing job of learning more about what happened, acknowledging what happened, mm. accepting responsibility where responsibility needed to be accepted, and beginning to make atonements for what happened in Black Wall Street. That brings us to today. Here we are 100 years later. Uh, if you if you were in Tulsa and you were to go to the corner of Greenwood and Archer, it's unrecognizable uh, compared right. to where it was a couple of years ago. So there are so many things happening. Um, in the next two weeks, we will begin with our Remember and Rise event that will happen on the anniversary, May 31st. Uh, we have national speakers, Stacey Abram coming in. Uh, we also have John Legend coming in to perform as part yeah. of that rise and remember. So we really just want to honor the lives of those that were lost uh, and celebrate Absolutely. the success that was Black Wall Street. You yeah. guys are doing so much. And I want to make sure we get to this before we run out of time. Cox has sponsored the creation of the extended reality mm -hmm. app called Greenwood Rising. Quickly, tell us what the app does and why Cox decided to be a part of it. I would love to. So the Greenwood Rising walking tour app is going to bring Black Wall Street to everyone who doesn't know what happened in 1921. So 
If you are in Tulsa, you'll have the ability to walk to a variety of street markers. It's a 45 minute narrated application. Uh, you can take your phone and you can go to each one of the walking tour markers, which is in front of an important business or establishment that mm -hmm. existed before the race riot. When you snap that QR code, it brings up an extended reality experience that takes you to what Black Wall Street looked like wow. in 1921. Current surroundings, uh, you can see Black Wall Street today, you can see what Black Wall Street was in 1921. If you're not yeah. in Tulsa and you can't make it here, uh, then you'll be able to visit a website where you'll see the 10 markers. You can go through the 45 minute narrative and then snap the screen to have the extended reality experience pop up on your phone. You that gotta have so that in person. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's gonna be a tremendous experience. Yes, I wish we had more time. We are out of time, but where can our viewers go to learn more? I, the best place to learn more is Tulsa2021.org. I also encourage you, if you don't know about Black Wall Street, sometime this month, pick up your Cox Contour remote, speak into it, Tulsa Race Massacre, Black Wall Street. will take you to a folder loaded with content so you're able to learn more, uh, celebrate the success that is Black Wall Street yesterday and today. Thank you for this opportunity. It was great to be able to be here thank with you today. Thank you so much. We appreciate no it. No problem. Thank you, Tiffany. Bye-bye. All right, Cheryl, no matter how you look at it, uh, you know, what we've experienced here in America, the goal overall is to rebuild and, 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 and have a better future, of course. And coming up next, we actually take a deep breath for those rehabbing from COVID. So stick around. We got more of Main Street Living coming up. Welcome back to Main Street Living. Danielle Quincy, we've heard about the COVID long haulers. And one of the many things that the COVID pandemic has put in the spotlight is just how important good lung function is to our overall health. Absolutely. And I think a lot of us didn't even realize that there is a special, specific therapy just to help you breathe better. Tammy Peavy, the clinical director at La Mesa Rehab, has a wealth of information about this. So let's bring her onto the show. Now, tell us about La Mesa Rehab. What do you guys do there, Tammy? Hi, thank you so much for having me. Uh, La Mesa Rehab is a CORF, which is a C-O-R-F, which stands for Comprehensive Outpatient Rehab Facility. And so we provide pulmonary rehabilitation by virtue of a combined comprehensive program with both physical therapy and respiratory therapy. This gives us a comprehensive approach uh, to therapy and certainly to the COVID long hauler, haulers. We're very well positioned to deal with some of these lung issues that these COVID survivors uh, are dealing with. Oh, okay, Tammy. Well, uh, Tammy, we actually have a clip of one of your patients uh, that was uh, going through the pulmonary therapy. Um, let's see, let's, let's take a look. Absolutely. Antes de COVID-19, yo hacía deporte, caminaba largas distancias, y hacía ejercicio dos o tres semanas, dos o tres veces por semana. Escuchaba música, bailaba con mi esposa, mis hijos, mis nietas. Después de COVID-19, El COVID me, es mi vida es muy dura y difícil porque me dejó muy dañado de mis pulmones y hoy en día no puedo caminar largas distancias, no puedo hacer ejercicio, no puedo levantar cosas del suelo y mucho menos cosas pesadas. En el hospital estuve yo siete meses, de esos siete meses, dos meses estuve en coma y cinco meses estuve con el ventilador y me hicieron una perforación aquí en mi cuello porque mis pulmones no funcionaban, estaban congelados, tenían agua y me tuvieron que extraer el líquido de los pulmones para poder sobrevivir. En la mesa Rehab he aprendido para lograr mis objetivos por medio de los tratamientos de la, la terapia de la sal y el uso del chaleco que vibra, que ayuda a remover todas mis flemas y todas las secuelas que me hayan quedado en mis pulmones. He aprendido a, a mantener 
mis niveles de oxígeno, a sentarme correctamente para que los pulmones se abran y pueda inhalar y exhalar correctamente. Y ya he aprendido a caminar distancias un poco, no tan largas, pero sí ya empiezo a dejar el oxígeno poco a poco. Con el apoyo de todas estas personas que trabajan aquí, que son muy amables y me han dado apoyo en todo lo necesario, mi, mi meta está siendo día con día mejor. Lo más importante en la vida es tener salud. Y eso es lo más importante para mí, recuperar mis pulmones al 100%. Y gracias a la Mesa Rehab lo estoy logrando. Y soy muy feliz. incredible to see how much progress he's made while working with you guys. Besides COVID, what are some of the other conditions that could benefit from pulmonary therapy? Well, we deal predominantly with COPD, which is a very mm -hmm. large classification of lung disease. I think it's really important whether you're talking about pulmonary rehab for COPD or COVID survivors is that we don't do a uh, rehab for one size fits all. We tailor mm -hmm. each one specifically to that lung problem. And we also work uh, in the community with some wonderful uh, pulmonologists who recognize the benefits of pulmonary rehab and refer their patients here for uh, follow up and for therapy. We work very closely with them, giving them uh, ongoing updates uh, of their progress. So there's a lot of different diseases that we deal with. We've been dealing with COPD and asthma, bronchiectasis, just about nine different categories of disease. And now uh, we're seeing a very strong increase in the uh, COVID post syndrome or what you're calling the long haulers. Wow. Well, Tammy, uh, bless you. You are breathing so much life uh, you know, back into people's worlds. Um, yeah. Where can the viewers find more information about your clinic? Well, you can go to our website, which is www.lamesarehab.com. We're located right across from the Grossmont Center. And then also, I think it's important to know that for those patients who have issues with transportation or getting here, we do provide free transportation to some patients. We never want yeah. transportation to be a reason that someone doesn't get to rehab. It's important to know that there's only 200 specialty clinics like this in the entire United States. So mm -hmm. we're very lucky to have this kind of therapy right in your own backyard here in San Diego. Wow, well, we're definitely lucky to have you. All right, so thank you so much for being a part of the show today and thank you for stopping by. Thank you very much for having me. All right, Tammy. Wow, Daniela, such an awesome uh, thing to celebrate, a win during the pandemic, of course. Yeah. Uh, speaking of wins, uh, Danielle, did someone say sports talk? Hmm? Yeah, it's coming to your view. All right, stick around. We'll find out together. Hey, welcome back to Main Street Living. Ladies, I know it is so great to have sports back after the forced time out last year. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and if you're not actually playing sports or watching sports, the next best thing is talking about sports. I would know. Our next guest does a lot of that on his podcast, Kaplan and Crew, which is now available to watch on your view. Welcome, Scott Kaplan to Main Street Living. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be with you guys. Fun stuff. All right, well, thank you for being here. Yeah, first of all, you have a very cool setup there. So you got to tell us what is Kaplan and crew about and what can fans expect each day on your show? Well, thanks. I mean, I'm in my home studio, as you can probably see behind me. This is actually really my house. This once was my son's bedroom. I had to turn it into a podcast studio through the pandemic. Uh, Kaplan and crew, I've been on the radio in Southern California, in San Diego, Orange County, and Los Angeles, in the Central Coast for the last 20 years. And... Um, over that period of time, lots of different iterations from radio shows that turned into TV shows. And now we were a radio show that became a podcast. The podcast became a radio show yet again. And now the podcast radio show has turned into a nightly TV show on your view. Look at that. And I know you and Channel 4 go way back. So what's it like now having your own show on Channel 4? I am so happy about this because you guys got to understand, like, when I first came to San Diego in 2001, Channel 4 was where everybody in town watched. I mean, everybody knew that channel because at the time, Channel 4 actually had the Padres. And so mm -hmm. if you wanted Padres baseball, you had to go to Channel 4. 
The other thing that was really cool is in 2003, um, Channel 4, we had the Super Bowl in San Diego, and Channel 4 did this whole thing called Media Day where we talked to the teams and we went into the stadium. And now that's the biggest day of Super Bowl week. It was all created by Channel 4 back in the day before there was an NFL network. So, yeah, I go way back with Channel 4. I had a show at one time called Scott and BR TV. That was my old radio show. And even that, we would just go do like MTV Cribs style interviews with local celebs and stuff. So, yeah, I have a long, deep history with Channel 4. Oh. Well, you mentioned the Padres there, too, if people wanted any coverage. They're actually worth watching now, but back in the day, not, maybe not as much. And speaking of back in the day, uh, tell us a little bit about your background and kind of your you know, evolution through radio and TV. Yeah, thanks for asking. I, I actually was a I, I played college football in Pittsburgh. Ooh. I, I, at Pitt. I Carol loves to, that. Really? Yeah. Although, sorry, you got to say I went to Penn State. So No way. <laughs> really? Yeah. So, you know, us and Pitt, we kind of clashed a little bit, but I'll forgive Big you. time. Big time. Thank you. And back at you. Um, yeah. So I, I played college football in Pittsburgh. I, I was going to start a TV career after college because I'd started to intern in radio in college uh, and started to intern in TV. And I knew all the local broadcaster types from my playing days. And um, I, I started literally in the local programming section of a TV station in Pittsburgh. I made five bucks an hour. I wasn't allowed to work more than 20 hours a week. And I just, you know, I bootstrapped it as a, but I remember some guy telling me, um, I wish I knew who he was, but he told me, he goes, you either want to be in media or you need to be in media. He goes, if you need to be in it, you'll, you'll find your way. And I wanted this microphone, you know, I wanted this, uh, I wanted this medium of talk radio. And so I've started in, um, in the early nineties in Pittsburgh and, um, I moved to New York city where I was on a radio station there called WNEW, oh. which was a really great old school, um, rock station that became a talk station. And I thought I was living the high life. I was 30 years old and I had a radio show in New York city and Howard Stern worked over here in the next studio wow. and Don Imus worked over there. And I thought it was going great. And it wasn't, <laughs> it all blew up in my face at 30 years old. I got a chance to come to San Diego and I've been here for 20 years. Isn't that's that a huge upgrade. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just have yeah. to say that as someone who grew up in California, the weather was an upgrade at least. Oh, Everything you know happens it. for a reason. And I know you have another endeavor too. Tell us about your new social media platform cited. I see the signs behind you. Yeah. So listen, I'll be brief, but, and thank you for this, but I really built this platform for guys like you and me. I mean, really we're, we're in the broadcast industry. We're in the media industry. We're all trying to create a bigger audience, a bigger following on social media and the fact is, is that we use these other social media platforms as a way to communicate and as a way to build brand. But the fact of the matter is, is those social media platforms make a lot of money off of us and the users. So true. Yeah. So what I've tried to do is create a platform. Um, it's called Cited. You can find the website Cited.co. You can download the app in the Apple App Store or the Google Store. And really what it is, it's an engagement tool. Um, it's a question and answer tool. It's polling. It's a deeper level of understanding of what people think. It's sentiment analysis. And I'm getting deep. But the bottom line is it's really fun. It's a, it's a gamified Ooh. opinion platform. So you use your opinions to compete and have fun. You earn points, you win prizes every week. The top 10 leaders on our, our uh, leaderboard win Amazon gift cards. They get sent. So you actually get something for your nice. time and your contribution. Well, if there's anything we know about sports fans, it's that everybody has an opinion. So that's good mm -hmm. that you made a platform for people to share theirs. We know your show Kaplan and crew tonight airs at 7 PM Monday through Friday on your view in California. It's also streamed on your view sports. What do you have coming up for Kaplan and crew tonight? Well, tonight, uh, the big story is going to be what happened between the Lakers and the Golden State Warriors, because when you have two superstars, LeBron James and Steph Curry, finding themselves playing each other in the first ever play-in game, I mean, these are the two stars of the Western Conference of the NBA. They should be number one and number two. Instead, they're number seven and number eight, and they're clawing their way into the playoffs. So to see a head-to-head -head matchup, which, by the way, ends with LeBron James hitting this gigantic, deep three-point shot with Steph Curry <laughs> defending him and in his face. I mean, th this is such a huge story. Uh, the recap and the reaction to what happened in that game will be a big story for us today. Oh, man. That hurt me last night for sure. <laughs> uh, well, it looks like I think we have Cheryl Boss there. So uh, I'm going to wrap it up for us. Thanks so much for joining us, Scott. And uh, make sure you guys check out Kaplan and Crew tonight. That airs 7 p.m. Monday through Friday on your review in California. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, guys. All right. Stick with us. Coming up, we have more Main Street Living. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back to Main Street Living. Now, I know this last year for a lot of people added a lot of stress to their lives and exercise is actually a great way to do something healthy for your body while also working through some stress. Definitely. And if your regular workout routine is feeling a little dull, it might be time to put a different spin on it with an exciting activity that I personally love that will give your muscles a workout and send your frustrations flying. Check this out. There's something really cool the first time you throw and it sticks in the board. There's just some like rush that comes over and you're like, all right, this is pretty cool. Once you experience that, you kind of get it. So bad axe throwing, something that started up in Canada um, and then it trickled its way down here. We're not just recreational axe throwing, we're actually affiliated with the World Axe Throwing League. So we will be throwing axes here. I wanna go over a couple safety things. You get to come in, you get to learn some games. We teach you how to throw, we throw parties kind of fun for anyone that walks by and comes in. Mostly it's the sound that they hear that makes them very curious as to what is going on. And honestly, all it takes is them just seeing some throwing and people laughing and having fun and them immediately wanting to do it. It's a great thing to do to get out of the house that's not going to drink or going to get something to eat. And there's a spirit of competition also. Um, you're doing something, you're playing a game uh, and you're cheering each other on. So it's not like I'm trying to beat you. I'm trying to help you get better and I'm gonna be excited when you smoke me and we get down to the last point and you smack that kill shot and I missed and I'm gonna be like, ah! When I'm getting ready to throw, what goes through my mind is breathing and calm. So I'm trying to center myself, make sure my breath is in time and not in hyper uh, fight or flight mode and then, you know, try and stick it in the board. This is a workout in itself. If you have never thrown before or done anything, you're using muscles that you've probably never used before. That was the case for me when I first started. I uh, woke up the next day like, what? what's going on here? And I was like, wow, that was actually pretty, uh, pretty good workout. This is the Cold Steel Axe Gang, and it comes about 20 inches long. Your throw and your axe is as unique uh, as you are as an individual. We can get in here and look at blade profile which is one of the bigger things, is that this axe is very thin towards the front of the blade, and this axe is a lot thicker, so it's gonna take more effort for this to penetrate the wood deeper. We always say as hard as you throw, as hard as it may bounce back, you honestly don't have to throw these axes really hard. They do all the work for you if you get the right sweet spot and your, uh, your, your technique down. Bad Axe Throwing has an Instagram where they upload awesome trick shots. The sport was viral out of the gate. People really like to show themselves in a joyous moment. And when you smack a bullseye or stick an ax, uh, it's a joyous moment. I've seen one where someone threw it underhand and then threw their hat on it, which was really cool. It takes a lot of practice. I think it's fun because it's more therapeutic than people might think it is. You come in, you don't know what kind of anger or frustration you had for the rest of the week. I get a high off of seeing people leaving here happy and just loving life after it. So if you got some stress or you just want to have some fun, I think this is an awesome thing to try to uh, take care of them. This really is a great way to get out some frustration. You guys have got to try it. And you can find out more information about becoming a bad axe on their website, badaxthrowing.com. Careful, That's Cheryl. Right. It's a family show. <laughs> <Yeah. That's> A-X-E. <right. laughs> well, coming up next, we're celebrating a step towards equality. So we'll be right back. Welcome back to Main Street Living. Well, public education has been one of the cornerstones of American society throughout our history, guys. Yeah. You are so correct, uh, Cheryl. But it has only been 67 years since the Supreme Court ruled that racial segregation in schools was unconstitutional. Think about that, only 67 years. That case was out of Topeka, Kansas. <clears throat> and, and we actually have Councilwoman uh, Karen Hiller here to tell us uh, how our community is marking the occasion. Uh, how you doing that, Karen? I'm good. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, welcome to the show. Um, now, quickly, can you remind us uh, what the Brown versus Board of Education decision was? Well, if you think back, um, there was a lot of there were lawsuits all over our country 
um, uh, regarding schools especially, not only, but schools, for uh, um, arguing that separate but equal was not good enough for children of color and that, in fact, everybody needed full equal opportunity in the schools. And the Brown v. Board of Education Supreme Court case was a landmark that pulled together five different cases from around the country. We mm -hmm. ended up being the lead on it. But those cases were carefully selected primarily by the NAACP, who was leading that effort, because they were different. There were, mm -hmm. there were schools from Washington, D.C., Virginia, um, North South Carolina, um, Kansas, and Delaware. And in some cases, the schools were radically different, really wonderful schools for the white kids and shacks for the black kids. In Topeka, which was sort of the other end of that spectrum, we had beautiful schools for both. It was truly separate but equal. And so those suits were brought together to say, even if it's separate but equal, that's not good enough. We must change things in our country. And wow. eventually that suit was won. And, and sometimes it's, it's been funny as we worked on it here in Topeka, the home of Brown v. Board, that's our trademark. Yet yeah. people all over the world it's a global beacon to the world. It changed the world. It changed more than education and it changed um, the attitude and the, and the, the, the process and the expectations all over the world. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Huge, a huge impact. And we're celebrating the 67th anniversary of that decision this month. Why do you think it's so important to keep remembering these kinds of milestones? Well, you have to look back to look forward for one thing, mm -hmm. and you also have to look back and look at not only where people were, but what were those dreams? What were they trying to do with this lawsuit? And as we we started working on this actually um, in, in 2012, did big events for the 60th anniversary and a really big 11 day event for the 65th. And one of our hallmarks from that was so okay, it's been 65 years. Uh, how we doing? Yeah. Which, of course, was a quite a conversation starter then. We had already planned to do annual smaller um, events, uh, like I say, annually, and then bigger ones on the five years. We've been planning this, and we had a spinoff from the 65th called Topeka United, a movement to start really, um, in and of itself, moving that agenda forward in Topeka because why not Topeka? And then of course, as we all know, 2020 happened in between and brought those issues. We thought maybe we'd have to, we'd been working and, and the 65th really got a lot of public attention and mm -hmm. people much more engaged. Uh, we thought for the, the movement that came out of that, that we'd need to spend 2020 kind of still building the agenda, but 2020 yeah. took up on its own and got way ahead of all that. Yeah, right. well, I think I think y'all are doing a marvelous job uh, just keeping, as you you said, looking back to uh, look forward. But really quick before we get out of here, uh, how can our viewers uh, find more about Brown versus Board and the event that you'll be holding on the 29th? We are having a, a daytime outdoor free event from 10 to 3 on our downtown plaza, and it will include stories of the plaintiffs, some of the plaintiffs there, um, dance, poetry, uh, music, and food, of course, and people can find out about that. Um, I see on the screen our Brown v. Board Sumner Legacy Trust, who is hosting, has a Facebook page and a website, and Topeka United, a movement as well, has an active Facebook page and, and website. So people awesome. can check the details there and hopefully all over social media. There you go. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much, Councilwoman Karen Hiller, for joining us. Main Street Living. <laughs> Stick with us. We have more coming up next. Welcome back into Main Street Living. Quincy Cheryl, another successful, very entertaining show in the books. Yes, yeah. I want to hug the puppet. <laughs> yeah, well, I know we learned a lot, and uh, you can check out our Cox Contour app, um, you know, for more history things, or just check out our show on the go.
That's right. And make sure you catch us on TV as well. We have brand new episodes every Monday at 9 p.m. local time. So check us out next time as we take another stroll down Main Street. We'll see you then.